Hello, hello. Hopefully we are now going live. It says we're now streaming. So hopefully you can find us now on Facebook. Happy Sunday, everyone, and happy Mother's Day. Um, thank you guys for tuning in tonight. I know it takes people a few minutes to find the video, so um, I am just so, so, so grateful um, that you guys have joined me tonight. Um, I think this is the first time ever that I have presented my own personal story presentation that I've given, like, I don't know, at least hundreds of times, I'm not sure. Um, but I've never really done this online and especially not in the last five years. <laughs> so um, I'm really, really excited for this opportunity. Please type in where you are watching from. Um, I won't be able to see it now, but I will like be super excited to go back and see all of your comments later and um, see where you are um, watching from. So um, type in um, that. And also if things are resonating with you, hit those little heart buttons or like buttons, and please share this video um, so your friends and your family can check it out as well. Um, please remember, of course, that also I can't give medical advice. So um, uh, if anything in my presentation is resonating with you on like a personal level and you have questions, please, please, please speak to a healthcare professional um, and your sleep specialist. Um, to um, learn more about that. Uh, we are just doing these videos for educational purposes. Uh, so those are just some of the ground rules. Um, but I'm just so excited to be here with you guys tonight. And I'm a little bit nervous. Oh, sorry. Um, but um, I think we'll go ahead and get started. I am not going to introduce myself because I am myself. Um, <laughs> but um, let's see, let me get my presentation slides up here. Okay, hopefully you guys can now see my slides. Um, first and foremost today, I wanna wish a very happy Mother's Day um, to my mom, Francine, and to all the mothers out there that are in our community, uh, whether you are a mother that has a sleep disorder or a mother of um, a child with a sleep disorder um, or a mother who is also a sleep researcher or a sleep clinician, uh, or, um, you know, also I want to give a shout out to my adopted, um, I have both a Australian mom and I have an English mom uh, who are also, uh, so hi to my English adopted mom, Sarah, and Melissa, my Australian adopted mom. So when I'm in America, um, my mom is Francine, <laughs> my real mom, but um, I just am so grateful for um, all the moms out there and um, also happy Nurses Week. If you guys have seen our awesome posts about uh, nurses with narcolepsy this week, um, there's just an incredible community out there um, and we're just so grateful for, for all of you. So I had a very average childhood. I had a plenty of energy. I was a, a tennis player. I was a swimmer, um, but mostly a tennis player, I'd say. I was New Hampshire state champion for tennis. I don't know if you guys know that about me. Yeah, that's right, really big deal. That is my medal there um, from being the New Hampshire state champion. Uh, I think there might be more cows in New Hampshire than people. So I'm not saying it's the biggest honor in the whole world, but still. Hey, New Hampshire state champ right here. Um, I also had a great fashion sense. I don't know if you can check out my really great Bermudas here uh, that are pretty high up. Um, so yeah, um, I think that high up look is now back in style, but um, this is me as a kid. I was ahead of my time in fashion and I had an older brother and an older sister. I was the youngest of three. Uh, that's my sister, Melissa and my brother, Chris. And I am definitely the baby of the family. I'm five and a half years younger than my brother and seven and a half years younger than my sister. So very much the baby. Um, I also had, um, whoops, what my slides seem out of order. Well, I'm missing a slide. <laughs> That's great. Um, am I really missing? Yeah, I'm missing a slide, okay. 
Um, so I had plenty of energy in high school as well. I definitely burned the candle at both ends so that I would be able to get into the college of my dreams. Um, and so I, I did everything in high school. I was a tri-varsity athlete. Um, I was a president of the photography club. I was in all the choirs, everything like that. And so then I did get into the college of my dreams, which is Brown University. Uh, and that's the slide that is missing. Um, I'm so sorry. Um, I, I was so happy to go there. Um, I was an art history major and I was on the varsity squash team. So um, I had practice once or twice a day for squash. I don't know if you guys are like familiar with squash as a sport, not the vegetable, but the sport. Uh, it's kind of like racquetball, but like more intense is what we say. Uh, it, was, it was a really fun sport and it was a great uh, team environment to be part of at such a big university. Um, and as an art history major though, I would often have our classes in the dark so, um, you know, like those old projection screens before everything was digital, you know, those old projection screens that were um, displaying art that was like Renaissance art or something that was a little bit boring. Um, and that's in college when I started to watch the clock in class because I would inevitably feel like I couldn't keep my eyes open and I needed to just get out of the classroom. Um, and so I watched the clock very carefully to figure out how soon I could go to the bathroom to wake myself up. Um, and so when I couldn't take it anymore, I'd go to the bathroom and I would slap myself and pinch myself and do jumping jacks and, you know, put cold water on the back of my neck tactics that we've all done at some point in our life. Um, and, uh, then I would go back to class feeling like a little bit better maybe, but, um, inevitably that feeling would come back again. And that was the hard part about timing this trip to the bathroom because I didn't wanna be the person that went to the bathroom multiple times a class, like that would seem weird, right? So, um, but I'd say probably once a class, I was going to the bathroom just to wake myself up. And at the time I really just thought average college behavior, uh, every college student's tired. I was a varsity athlete. We had practice once or twice a day. Um, I had a social life, uh, and unfortunately, you don't get to see the picture of me wearing my blueberry muffin costume because that is um, one of the very coolest costumes I've ever made, which I made in college. Um, and so, you know, I just had a very busy life, and I just assumed all the usual excuses. Um, when I graduated from college, I moved to Boston into the Fenway District, which is just about four blocks from Fenway Park. Woo woo! If you're a Red Sox fan, you know how cool that is. Uh, it was just this ideal apartment. Uh, it was so beautiful and had this beautiful bay window in the front. It was just very Boston. And um, But one of the first nights I lived in that apartment, I awoke in the middle of the night because I heard a burglar breaking in through the bay window in the front. And um, I, hear him, I could hear him filling with the window. And all at once I saw my door open and this man rush at me with his arms stretched out towards my neck, like he was about to strangle me. And I was terrified, but the weird thing is I couldn't respond. So I wanted to like kick him or like, just like get up out of bed and run away, but I couldn't move. And I just shuddered in terror thinking like, what's he gonna do to me? Cause I can't move. And I don't know how long that was, but the next thing I looked up and he wasn't there. So, I thought, well, where'd he go? <laughs> uh, and so I went and I tiptoed and I could move now. So I, I got up and I, I opened my door and I looked out into the living room to realize that the window that I thought he'd broken into wasn't broken into. And then I realized that my roommate was still asleep and he had been like really loud. So I couldn't imagine that my roommate had been able to sleep through all that noise. So then I thought, well, I guess there wasn't a burglar, which is a good thing, right? Um, but at the same time, I couldn't say that it was like a dream because I'd had plenty of dreams before. Um, and that really didn't feel like this. This felt like it had really happened. So I went to bed just kind of unsure, but I guess glad that there wasn't really a burglar in my apartment. A few weeks after that, I was just chatting with my roommate in our living room one day and I was getting ready to go for a run along the Charles River, uh, which is my usual stomping grounds when I lived in Boston. I was a big runner at the time after graduating from college. And um, as we were joking about something, um, I laughed and 
I felt like my knees like melted inside, like almost someone had poked behind my knees, you know, that like as a joke, but no one had. And I said to my roommate, whoa, did you just see my knees? I just did the strangest thing. She said, no, I didn't see anything. I thought that's strange. So I wasn't sure if I should go for my run because like, were my knees gonna give out again? Um, so I walked around the apartment longer and I stretched and kind of like, you know, whatever, did some different exercises and my knees seemed fine again. And so I just went for my run. And I didn't think that much of it until a few weeks or months after that, when I was laughing about something else and I felt the same sensation. And after a few times of this happening that I start to realize it was always when I was laughing. And so I would say to my friends, um, I was working at a, a law firm as a file clerk at the time, I'd say, don't make me laugh, my knees, my knees. And I kind of like reach for something nearby to lean on. The strange thing is for a while, like no one else saw anything. They just saw me kind of like, you know, kind of going towards something to lean on it, but they never saw the motion of like my knees buckling. So I didn't know like, is it in my head or is it really happening? Well, um, a year after graduating from college, I started law school at age 22 at Boston College and I was really excited about this. Um, uh, my dad was an attorney and had just loved being a lawyer. <laughs> and I was really excited to follow in his footsteps. He'd actually um, convinced me to go to law school uh, in thinking about art law because I was an art history major. And so um, kind of like combining my love of art with law to study art law. So that's how he convinced me to go to law school. And um, I was excited to be there. I thought that I would have no problem succeeding here like I'd succeeded at every other point in my educational career. Um, now we were typing on laptops though. So that was new, like in college, we were always like handwriting notes. And now in law school, we were typing um, our notes. And so often um, as class, you know, was going on, it would just, um, my notes would start perfect. Like the beginning of class would be like bullet point and color coded, just beautifully notes. And as class would go on though, they would get sketchier. And so they would be like random words standing by themselves, words from outside of class seemingly mixed in with like property law. So I think like somehow one day Brad Pitt made it into property law. I don't really know how, <laughs> but um, it was, you know, it sounds kind of funny, but at the same time at the end of class, I would look back at my notes and see like that the second half of class was just gibberish. And I would just have to erase that portion of my notes and think I just have to make up for this some other time. And I was still going to the bathroom during class at least once uh, to wake myself up. So I continued doing that, my, my bathroom tactics. Um, but I, really, I just wanna emphasize that at this point, um, my eyes were open for a lot of this. So even though I was typing gibberish into my notes or I um, was going to the bathroom to, to you know, wake myself up, my, my head was never like f over my laptop asleep that wasn't what I was experiencing. My eyes were open, but cognitively I was just gone. I was on another planet and I was fighting so hard to, um, to remember what the teacher was saying and to type my notes and just say, to stay present. Um, so it took only a few months into law school where I thought maybe just, I wasn't cut out for law school. Um, it was after Thanksgiving and I'd uh, driven back to law school the day after Thanksgiving to um, prepare for my first semester exams. And um, after about three hours of being in the law library that day, I realized I'd made it through like two pages of reading. And uh, I thought I'd somehow lost my willpower because this felt like it was a really important time of my life. Like this was the most important, like building towards everything in my life. Like, okay, now I'm in law school and the first year is the most important year. Uh, so this is the time to really dig in, Julie, and use all your strength, you know? Um, and it just wasn't there. It didn't seem to be there. And I thought maybe this just isn't for me. Like I'm not cut out for this or I've lost my willpower, even though I don't know where my willpower would have gone. Um, so it was a really challenging year. That year uh, during the spring break, um, so that was in February, 
I went to visit one of my best friends from undergrad, um, Melissa, who she was now in graduate school in uh, London. And so we had a really great trip. Now uh, you can see us up top here, I'm sure really bothering this guard, uh, he probably, well, you know, maybe he's used to it, but, um, you know, we just had a great trip um, going to museums. We were both art history majors in college. So going to museums and, and having English tea and scones and all that good stuff. Well, that same trip one day, I also fell asleep at a Starbucks at about, I don't know, it was in the afternoon, it was maybe 4 p.m. And I was like totally passed out. Uh, so my friend Melissa did take these photos of me um, and she says that she, she feels bad now, of course, looking back, but um, I tell her it's great for my presentation. So I'm glad she took these. Um, and, you know, really the most, the most of the trip though, even though I do have these photos of me asleep like this, um, I also have a full album of this vacation that is all the smiling photos, right? The ones like the one on top. These are the two I did not put in my Facebook album after the trip. Um, but it was, you know, at least a, a portion of what was happening as I was struggling to stay awake. I did think at the time, it's just jet lag, right? But um, even though I had been there like a week at that point, you know, whatever, it's, it's hard to switch time zones. But that same trip, I also went to see Wicked, uh, which was like my favorite thing. I had listened to the soundtrack like at least a hundred times uh, and I hadn't seen the show yet. So um, imagine like whatever your thing is in life, like whether that's football and it's a Super Bowl or it's, you know, you're a soccer fan and it's the World Cup. Um, or I don't know, you're a Dancing with the Stars fan and it's a grand finale, like whatever your thing is, like this was my thing at the time. So this is like the big moment. I was really excited to go see Wicked finally. And I got all dressed up. Here's my, you know, glamorous selfie at the time. Um, and I went to see Wicked and it was amazing, of course, um, at the end of the, wait, I shouldn't give it away if you haven't seen it, but the end of the first stack was incredible. And I'm just loving this so much. Um, and then during the intermission, I did get a beer um, and, um, you know, treating myself. And I went back to the second half. Um, is that what it's called? Second act um, and sat down again and got pretty sleepy pretty quickly. And I ended up sleeping through the second half. And, um, you know, at the time, I didn't think that much of it because it didn't really matter. There wasn't any consequences, but it was just disappointing. And I like to bring this up as an example of how I was starting to lose things that I, moments that I wanted to be part of, you know? Um, so this wasn't like dense coursework of law school. This was my thing that I wanted to be most awake for. And I was struggling with that now. Um, at the end of that year, so uh, the end of my first year of law school, we were during uh, exams again. And so they had this wonderful week where all we had to do was study for exams. We didn't have classes anymore. It was just like a study week. And so it was during that week when I um, was getting lots of sleep because I didn't have to be at class in the morning. And uh, so I'd probably gotten like 10 hours of sleep one night. And uh, the next morning I, I got up, I had coffee and oatmeal and you know my usual routine. And I got in my car and I was going to make the 15 minute drive to uh, Boston College Law School, which is in Newton. Uh, just like 15 minutes down Starrow Drive um, and Soldiers Field Road, if you guys know Boston. Um, it's a really quick drive, but um, I was just about five minutes from law school when I was in this, uh, this circle of death in Newton is what they call it. It's a very busy, uh, challenging intersection of many different lights and di directions and all that. And I was sitting at a light and I just remember the lights of the car in front of me like flickering, like there's three lights. And then all at once I felt like I was seeing like six or nine lights um, behind the car. And, um, but I was only five minutes from school. So I was like, just stay awake, Julie, just stay awake. Um, you can get there, you can get there. It's just a mile down the road. Well, the next thing I remember, I, I woke up in the parking lot of the law school. My car was fine, I was fine. I was parked fine. My seat was reclined and everything, but um, I didn't remember getting there. So I couldn't picture in my head like pulling into campus or choosing that parking spot, turning my car off, reclining my seat. Like those memories weren't in my brain. And I just remember sitting there and thinking, I'd had 10 hours of sleep 
it was 10 o'clock in the morning. I'd had coffee. I'd had oatmeal, you know, I no more excuses. Like something was wrong. Um, because I'd thought of everything by now. At some point I had convinced myself that I, uh, you could have too much caffeine and get tired from having too much caffeine or, you know, too little, or I wasn't a night owl, or I wasn't a morning person or, um, you know, hot rooms are the problem or dark rooms. Like, but this felt like, how can I not be able to drive 15 minutes to school in the morning? So it really scared me. And for the first time I thought maybe I have a sleep problem. So I, um, I did, after exams were over, I, um, I did go to a primary care doctor finally. Um, and I brought up a few different things to her. This is the actual records from that appointment. You probably won't be able to read it. So I kind of highlighted a few things here on the right. Uh, one of the first things I said to this primary care doctor at Boston College was, I think I have a sleep disorder. <laughs> um, I described that I'm sleeping all the time and, and never feeling rested. Um, I remember she did ask me more about my sleepiness, like what that was you know why that how that was playing out in my life and and telling her about having trouble driving and i distinctly remember her saying back well we all get tired sometimes when we drive even i have to pull over for a coffee at times man the strangest thing because when she said that i had like the slightest voice inside me like just the tiniest little 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 inner voice that said to me i don't think we're talking about the same kind of sleepiness but I had no idea what it was like to be in her body and what level of sleepiness she felt on a, on a day versus what I was feeling. So um, she wanted to check my thyroid and um, she did uh, suggest depression. I didn't feel depressed. I, I actually had experienced some depression earlier, earlier when I was in college, but um, this, I just felt really, really tired. And, um, but I was willing to try anything. So I actually did pursue uh, meeting with a therapist based on this appointment. Um, and she said that she would send me for a sleep study if uh, everything was all right with my thyroid and um, some other things like that. Um, the second thing I brought up to her is that my, when I was laughing very hard, my knees were giving out and my head was heavy. Um, she thought that, you know, I, I actually said, I think it might be neurological because I, I connected that basically like if emotions were causing my body to do something, maybe that's neurological. I'm not a scientist or a doctor by any means, but um, so I suggested that she said, well, maybe, um, and I could send you to a neurologist, but you'll probably just find out it's, it's something rare that you're just going to have to get used to. Um, that was really hard to hear because by this time it, it was getting worse. So one day I was waiting for, um, the walk signal at a, at a crosswalk, uh, you know how you wait and then you get the walking man and so it's your turn to go. And um, a car almost turned in to like take a right hand into my walk, um, crosswalk. And I kind of like shot the car like a glare, like don't you dare. And my knees buckled, uh, almost like stumbling like in the sidewalk, which is a really bad place obviously to stumble. So I made it across the crosswalk, but um, you know, that was pretty scary. It was also starting to affect, like, it also wasn't funny. <laughs> so it wasn't just laughter anymore. It was other emotions. Um, and so her idea that I was just going to get used to this was not so exciting. Um, and thankfully, other people were seeing that now. So uh, I had been watching a Kristen Wig. I don't know if you guys know Kristen Wig. She's hilarious. She's like from um, the Bachelorette movies and I just love her. I think she's great. So I was watching an SNL skit with her, uh, with one of my best friends from law school. And uh, we were standing over like a law library cubicle. And as we were watching this skit and I was laughing hard, I like fell, like my whole body fell onto the, onto the cubicle, um, which kind of hurt, but it was okay. Um, and so definitely like my friend saw that and was like, that's weird. Um, and I was like, I know I had been asking doctors and, and friends, uh, tried Googling it the whole nine yards. And I just really couldn't figure out what it was for the longest time, including at this point. So thankfully I had a third problem, which was runner's knee because I was still running a lot. Um, and I was starting to have pain under my knees, which had nothing to do with my knees buckling with laughter. I just was like, when I was running, I started to have some pain under my knees. So um, I mentioned that and she uh, recommended I see a sports therapist at Boston College. So a few days later, I went to see a sports therapist about my runner, runner's knee. 
and we, we were in like a, you know, a, she was asking me like 20 questions about my knees and she asked if they ever buckle. And I said, well, there's this thing that happens when I laugh. It has nothing to do with my running. Um, she said, no, tell me more about it. So I described more that it was sometimes when I was annoyed or angry or laughing, like my knees just seemed to like be giving out. And she said, I think I've heard of that. I think that's called cataplexy. So she wrote down this word cataplexy for me on a piece of scrap paper. And she said, I could look it up when I got home. And then we went back to talking about my runner's knee. So after that appointment, I went home with this little scrap paper and I Googled cataplexy for the first time. And I saw it was sudden striking episodes of muscle weakness, usually triggered by strong emotions such as laughter, exhilaration, surprise, or anger. Oh my God, it was like these words had been written for me. I really had tried to Google around myself, but I hadn't found that. Um, and I read the severity may vary from a slackening of the jaw or a buckling of the knee to falling down, which definitely made sense for how mine was progressing. And the duration could be a few seconds to several minutes. And the person remains fully conscious, even if unable to speak during the episode. At this point, really, I wasn't having any full body or, you know, minute long attacks. I was just having these little moments of weakness. But then I read it affects roughly 70% of people who have narcolepsy. And I thought, narcolepsy? No, I don't have narcolepsy. Like that's a joke about someone falling asleep in the middle of a sentence or while they're standing. Like that's not me at all. Hmm. Well, you know how like Wikipedia works. So I was like on the cataplexy page and I was like, well, let me see this narcolepsy. So when I read the real symptoms of narcolepsy for the first time, um, I was really surprised. Excessive daytime sleepiness, you know, feeling like I um, was just so, so, so exhausted um, multiple times a day. That was definitely happening to me. Um, and the reason that I, you know, had gotten so tired when I was driving or during class or, or trying to study. Then the cataplexy, which I just described, which is definitely happening to me. And then hypnagogic hallucinations and sleep paralysis. So hypnagogic hallucinations are um, vivid, uh, you know, being able to basically see things, feel things and hear things as if it's really happening to you as you're falling asleep or as you're waking up. Uh, so this can be really scary things like that burglar that broke in to my apartment or like really mundane things. So I, I had experienced many more, like the burglar hadn't gone away. Like I had the burglar visit me like many nights. Um, I just hadn't thought of it as like a medical problem necessarily, but, um, it could be also like one day I was napping and I, I thought this cat was scratching me and, um, uh, but I couldn't move to like move the cat. And then I woke up again and like looked over and I was like lo looking for the scratch marks of a cat and then realizing like, I don't own a cat. And, uh, so, you know, it can be just, it, it, or hearing things like I could hear the most beautiful music sometimes, or, um, a rap concert happening outside my window when I'm sleeping at night. So a lot of different uh, things, it's, it's very interesting. And the sleep paralysis is that inability to move while that's happening. It can sometimes happen without the hallucination or uh, in my experience, those are usually to happen together. And then disrupted nighttime sleep. So, um, you know, unlike public perceptions of narcolepsy, people um, with narcolepsy just don't sleep all the time, um, but the sleep cycle is disrupted. So. Um, I actually have always been a really good sleeper. That was like, my thing is like, I'm a great sleeper. I can sleep, you know, kind of like whenever I want. Um, so I didn't feel disrupted nighttime sleep was necessarily like something that I had thought, I, I thought I could sleep 10, 12 hours, 14 hours, no problem. But um, I wasn't going into necessarily the right kind of sleep at night. Uh, so narcolepsy is a chronic neurological disorder involving REM sleep or uh, rapid eye movement dream sleep. Uh, and so it's different aspects of, of dream sleep actually that are, you know, misfiring. And uh, narcolepsy affects one in 2,000 people, 200,000 Americans, and 3 million people worldwide. There are two types of narcolepsy narcolepsy with cataplexy, which is a type I have, and narcolepsy without cataplexy, which is type two. And it you know, basically it's just narcolepsy. It can, the people with narcolepsy without cataplexy can have um, all of the other symptoms of narcolepsy just without the cataplexy. 
And um, they know now that narcolepsy type one is uh, due to a loss of hypocretin or orexin. Um, it's a neurotransmitter in the brain. I don't know exactly uh, what brought on my own case. Um, it's usually like upper airway flus uh, or infections and um, also of genetic predisposition. So I did have the genetic predisposition I found out and then I don't know uh, what environmental factors led to my development, um, but I definitely have type one and less is known about the uh, causes of narcolepsy without cataplexy at this point. But I will report more on that a little bit later in my presentation. So, oops, I have to go back. Uh, after I knew what narcolepsy was myself uh, from Googling it on this summer day, I didn't know who exactly to go to about it. But luckily, one of my friends from law school, I, when I mentioned, I said, I think I might have narcolepsy. Uh, she said that her dad had a friend who was actually a narcolepsy specialist at Beth Israel, which was literally about three blocks from my apartment in the Fenway. So like I could not have lived any closer to one of the best narcolepsy specialists in America unless I'd lived in the hospital itself. So I actually was so lucky that I got to see one of the best specialists very quickly. And after an initial meeting with this uh, great narcolepsy specialist, he was 99% sure I had narcolepsy with cataplexy, uh, but I would have to wait to do a 24 hour sleep study to confirm my diagnosis. Um, so, I thought this was a problem I was gonna take care of over the summer. This was like my summer problem because this should certainly not get in the way of the beginning of my second year of law school. That was a very important time uh, with job interviews and getting back to classes. And, um, but my sleep study was scheduled for the second day of my second year of law school in early September. Uh, so I went to my sleep study, had that done. Uh, it's an overnight portion and then a, a nap test during the day. Uh, which is kind of a weird experience. And um, a few weeks after that, I went back to my sleep specialist or my narcolepsy expert at Beth Israel and received my official diagnosis. So um, my doctor was really excited by the results of my sleep study because I'd gone into REM dream sleep so quickly in all five of my naps that it was really you know, showing a very strong case of narcolepsy. Uh, so he was really excited to show my results to his residents and um, trainees to show like what narcolepsy is like on paper. I remember thinking, oh, this isn't so exciting. Um, it was validating though, for sure, because all these different parts of my life that I couldn't explain had come together under this word narcolepsy. And um, so it was validating, but it also like, I didn't want to be like a great narcolepsy patient. Like I didn't want to like have like amazing narcolepsy. I just wanted to be like an amazing law student, um, preparing for my career as a lawyer. So, um, at that point we also started discussing treatments and, uh, my, uh, doctor started describing, you know, a daytime stimulant and also a nighttime treatment that I would take as I was going to sleep and then halfway through the night in the middle of the night. And when my doctor started describing this nighttime medication to me, I was like, mm, no, um, because I just didn't like all the rules around it. I wouldn't be able to eat two hours before I took it. Um, I wouldn't be able to drink alcohol really. I'm thinking, no, 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 this isn't, this isn't. All right, let's get to the good option. Where's the good option for medication? When's that coming? And then he finished like talking and I was like, oh, I guess that's the good option. Um, so, it was a really hard moment, but I have to back up four days to describe um, my 24th birthday. So four days before I was officially diagnosed, I turned 24 and it so hap just so happened that my birthday fell the same night as the law school boat cruise, which is a big deal, guys. Uh, it's like a really fun night where we go out on the Boston Harbor. And um, because it was my birthday, my friends got me this great tiara which is like really, really tall and amazing with feathers and glitter galore. I've never seen a tiara quite like it. It's pretty amazing. Um, we had, my friends and I had like water wings and we had like tube floats, like in case we like fell into the Boston Harbor. So um, we just had a really fun night. And because it was my birthday, people were definitely buying me drinks. Um, and so, um, you know, had like a super fun, fun night. The next morning though, I woke up and still had like glitter on me. And I remember like being like, oh, like best birthday ever, you know? Uh, and I started walking to the bathroom though and, and thought of something funny from the night before. And as I laughed, um, 
my knees buckled, which I was used to at this point, you know, like I, I knew that sensation, but I kind of like leaned against the wall of my apartment and kind of slithered down to the ground, I would describe. Uh, and it was the longest I felt like I wasn't in control of my body. So I was awake in my head and I could feel my body falling into this kind of like heap of myself on the floor. And I just remember thinking like, move a finger, move a toe, Julie, just like move. And I remember wanting to breathe deeper. Like I could breathe, I guess, but I didn't feel like I was getting enough air and I wanted to just like breathe deeper, Julie, but I couldn't. And as I just lay there, it is just the most surreal feeling I've ever felt in my whole life and terrifying. So even if it, I think maybe it was 30 seconds at most, it was like the longest 30 seconds of my life um, being awake in my head, but unable to move anything in my body. So um, as quickly as it had come on, it, it went away though. And so I could move all at once again. I could move my fingers and my, and my feet and I could stand again. So I got up, I went to the bathroom. Um, but I felt the sensation again pretty soon after. And that was really different too. So usually if I ever felt the sensation, it was like a one day type of thing. It, it didn't like come back multiple times. So the fact that I felt the sensation again so quickly made me realize, oh, this is way worse than I've ever felt my cataplexy. Um, so I was supposed to drive my roommate to the um, airport that day. And I knew like, I'm not going to be able to drive. So I called my boyfriend at the time and I asked him to uh, drive my roommate to the airport. He drove her to the airport and then he came back and um, just sat with me on the couch all day. And we watched movies. I was in and out of sleep. Um, and that night he actually carried me in his arms to bed. Um, and I remember feeling like this is kind of a low moment <laughs> um, where I was upset because I was missing social events that night. But I also remember thinking, thank God, this is a Saturday and not Monday because I had like, I had like a major job interview on Monday. So if you fast forward four days to this appointment where my doctor is talking about making all these lifestyle changes uh, to be able to take this treatment for narcolepsy, um, I had to realize like I needed to be able to walk. <laughs> and so like something like drinking alcohol versus like walking, like I just never seen my life in those terms, but I was like, oh, I guess I, I guess I should choose walking. Um, and so I tried that treatment that he suggested, even though it scared me um, at first. And um, so I definitely, within a few weeks or maybe a few months, I started to really feel the benefits of the treatments that I was trying. And I just, uh, this is my law school library. You're welcome. So you get to get, feel like you're at BC Law. Uh, this is where we, you know, would be studying a lot. Uh, and um, I wanted to read a passage from one of the days, a few months after starting uh, medication, where I was studying at one of these tables. Okay. One night, while studying at a group table in the library, I looked at the clock to see it was past 9 p.m. and realized that I hadn't taken a nap yet. Usually by this hour, my daytime stimulant had worn out and I'd already thrashed in and out of fogginess at least a few times, taking a nap or two or fighting off an excruciating heaviness. This night, there was absolutely no heaviness, no clog connections in my brain, no nagging at my eyelids. The feeling of nothing would usually go undetected but it was so foreign to me that nothing felt like something. In the hushed silence of the law library, tears streamed down my cheeks and fell into the crease of my textbook. I didn't bother to hide my face or wipe my tears. Instead, I sat still in awe of this strange realization. The gap between wakefulness and sleepiness was much wider than I'd thought. I'd lost touch entirely with what true wakefulness felt like. I saw it now as powerful because it was so free. I could think and study and make connections without any heaviness on my head. 
I decided this was my nighttime medication, improving my wakefulness independently of the daytime stimulant. On my stimulant, all my sensations were heightened and I was amped up, which somewhat masked my sleepiness, but not entirely. I often felt both jittery and exhausted simultaneously. This wakefulness was different. It was quiet and calm, as if, some, as if someone had whiff, lifted the weight off my skull and allowed my brain to work at its own pace. I savored the freedom inside my skull. So it was definitely, you know, the medication had really helped with my sleepiness. Like I hadn't realized how sleepy I was even. And it had also really helped my cataplexy. So I wasn't afraid of falling all the time. Um, I also, you know, started talking about this with the Dean of the law school and um, she had offered accommodations. I didn't have to fight for them, which is one of the things I'm most thankful for in my life because I never would have fought for them. Um, looking back on how kind of I was afraid of like accepting help and all this, but she offered me these great accommodations. And at first I said, no, I, no, thank you. I don't need those. And then I went back a little bit later and I was like, hey, about those accommodations. So I was able to take my tests um, with one third extra time. I, she gave me a study carol in the library, which was usually only for like the law review students. Um, but I got my own study carol in the basement, which was kind of like a hidden place, which was really helpful for being able to somewhat privately a little bit uh, privately nap. And um, I was able to have extended time on papers. Uh, and I was able to get to choose my classes um, ahead of other people, which was really helpful because my uh, the dean of the law school had suggested more uh, participate like more discussion based classes as opposed to lecture based, which definitely really helps. Like if you could be part of a discussion, I was more able to stay awake than a lecture based class. So some of those more discussion classes were smaller and more popular classes. So I got into those a little bit easier, which was really nice. Um, so um, very thankful for that. At the same time, though, it really wasn't just like rosy and perfect. I thought that it would be like I'd just take medication and, and go back to normal and go on my life as planned and become an art law lawyer. Um, and this was just a small road bump, right? But uh, it started to feel a little bit more like this road here in pictured, like road bump after road bump after road bump. <laughs> uh, my grades were not great. I didn't get the dream job at a big law firm that I'd really hoped to get. And I, um, my boyfriend, after, you know, we'd been dating for about a year at this point and he broke up with me and said we weren't having fun anymore, which was definitely true. We really weren't having fun. It was a really challenging time. Uh, and so I started to feel like I was sort of like watching a nightmare of like someone else's life go wrong. Like this wasn't, this wasn't how law school was supposed to go, but it was my life. And um, so I also, I looked the same like on the outside. And so it really wasn't always so clear to everyone like what was happening. Um, and I just wanted to read again, one more passage about uh, from my book about like this kind of duality, I guess. During a check-in with Dean Wilson at school, we reflected back on our first meeting and how I'd so adamantly resisted her suggestion that narcolepsy may have affected my first year grades. We both laughed. I told her more about my diagnosis process and my doctor getting excited about how bad my narcolepsy was. She admitted that she was surprised to hear that my case was serious. I guess you just seem so put together, she said. I prided myself on this deception. Yet it did me no favors if I wanted sympathy from people who only saw my outer skin. From Dean Wilson's perspective, and perhaps from most people's perspective, there was no signs of illness or struggle written across my forehead. I brought the act to law school, diligently played, uh, planned and orchestrated the disguise, playing the part of the perfect young woman I so wanted to be. It never transformed me into healthy again, but it kept my dignity high, even when I was sweating, sweating, gagging, and terrorized by my hidden side of life. I wiped away the spit, sweat, and tears in the bathroom. I fooled them all but I was also fooling myself. Um, so the other thing I came to realize was that uh, I didn't like people's perceptions of narcolepsy. 
Uh, at first, I was excited to tell my friends because I, they kind of like lived this experience with me, you know, of these mysterious things. Now I had the words for it, um, but not everyone, but some people just kind of had a joking response, like, like, oh my gosh, you're gonna fall asleep right now? Like, how about right now? Um, other people kind of responded as if it was something small and, and insignificant. And I kind of had hoped it was like having a flu that was just gonna go away. But uh, as I, the longer I, you know, was going through all these medication adjustments and having side effects from them and, um, you know, I just realized like narcolepsy was quite serious and I didn't really have the tools or the words to communicate that with the people I loved. Uh, and so I pretty much stopped telling people about my narcolepsy. And over those two years of law school, I kind of kept it to myself as much as I could. Um, I think it was a really hard realization to uh, figure out that I was dealing with like a serious neurological condition um, that shared a name for some reason with something that was socially acceptable to laugh at. So uh, it was at my lowest too, a few months after I was diagnosed really that I, I just thought I hated narcolepsy, you know, um, and I wanted to somehow get back at it. Um, and I didn't know exactly how I would do that, but I just couldn't stand it. And I wanted it out of my life. And I knew that like, I couldn't like cure it by myself, but I, I, I wanted to like somehow like prove it, prove to narcolepsy that I was like better. I was going to, I was going to get back at it. <laughs> so I didn't know how I'd ever do that at the time, but, um, so even though I felt very alone and, and pretty isolated in my law school environment, uh, one of the first people who really got it was my dad. Um, about seven, seven months into my diagnosis, my dad and my stepmom um, dragged me somewhat <laughs> to a narcolepsy network conference in Albany, New York. I really didn't want to go. I didn't know what it would be like, but I just felt scared and hesitant. And I'm really glad that they um, insisted that we go together. And uh, so I want to read a quick passage from my book about that experience. On Sunday morning, dad came into my hotel room to talk over the logistics of the conference and the drive home. He turned to leave and then he stopped at the door and walked back toward me. Had he forgotten something? I'm so proud of you, Jules. He opened his arms to hug me, which was strange. He wasn't much of a hugger. He'd always been sort of an awkward dad, not the touchy feely type. He hugged me tightly and then his body began to shake, and I realized he was crying. Weeping, really. He convulsed in my arms. I'd never seen him cry, never mind felt him cry. It made me so sad I didn't want to hug anymore. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, he repeated between sobs. It's okay, Dad. He finally let me go and sat on the edge of my bed, rocking back and forth and clasping his hands tightly. It's a place he'd seen me many times. He'd listened patiently to my hopeless sobs, most recently with the breakup. I sat next to him on the bed, unsure what to say or do. I didn't understand before, but I get it now, he finally said. It's much worse than I realized. Funny, I thought he'd understood my narcolepsy better than anyone else, but now he thought he got it. It's not your fault, I said but it's not fair, you're so young. It's gonna be okay, daddy. This was a white lie and we both knew it, but what else could I say? Eventually he calmed down and left. I looked around the bare hotel room and finished folding my clothes into my suitcase in silence. The conference had a big effect on dad, perhaps bigger than it had on me. Now he held his own burden to love someone deeply, his youngest child, his fabulous jewels, and watch her navigate a serious illness. He'd always been my knight in shining armor, helping me through all my lowest points, but he couldn't save me from narcolepsy. So it was really hard to see him upset, but at the same time, I really needed his support. So I wasn't walking through this alone. 
sorry. <laughs> I get a little emotional. It's my thing. <laughs> So the other person that I really needed to understand and support me is also in this photo. And that is myself. Um, so finding some self-acceptance for me was really important part of my own journey. And I just wanted to read another passage from my book about that experience. Uh, this was in my last semester of law school. I jumped out of bed at 9 a.m. and stumbled to the bathroom still slightly woozy and disoriented. Arriving at school just past 9.30 a.m., the closer parking lot was full and I had to park in the far lot. Speed walking to the law school, my mind clattered with my usual inner dialogue. You've missed half of class, Julie. What the hell is wrong with you? Get it together. Just outside the law school building, I closed my eyes and I took a deep breath. The negative statements echoed in my mind and for once, I recognized this voice, this voice for what it was, poison. I'd been scolding myself for my every misstep since being diagnosed with narcolepsy. Self-criticism had motivated me to work harder in the past, but now I was only hurting myself. With little to no positive reinforcement from others, beating myself up did not make sense. If I wasn't compassionate towards myself, no one else would be either. It had to start within. Your circumstances are unique, Julie. Just staying in school is an accomplishment, I told myself. This voice came out of nowhere. No one had suggested this, but I had a growing suspicion that outside of this bubble and in the long run, staying in school with narcolepsy was a success. I wasn't sure I believed this fully, but I had to try. I vowed to muffle the negative self-talk and I joined class 40 minutes late, knowing I was doing my best. So I don't know if that resonates with anyone's experience, if they've ever, you know, kind of used negative uh, self-talk as a way of motivating yourself and uh, at being at this low point for my own self and realizing uh, I had to be supportive of myself and be more accepting of what I was going through for me. I studied health law because it kept me awake. Uh, I was fascinated by rare disease drug development uh, and trying to understand why there weren't uh, hypocretin agonist treatments uh, that could be more you know, beneficial for people with narcolepsy. Um, so that's why I studied rare disease drug law and health policy. And uh, I did graduate on time I'd say, you know, very lucky. I still have dreams or nightmares sometimes that it was all a joke and, uh, you know, I actually didn't graduate, but I did. <laughs> so um, there's me getting my diploma. And um, I, after I graduated, I moved to Washington, D.C. to start advocating for narcolepsy and to start writing a book. So I kind of did a 180 because I had been really private about my narcolepsy for the two years of law school, but then I realized we were kind of caught in this catch-22 where a lot of people with narcolepsy didn't like the misperceptions of narcolepsy like I didn't. Uh, and so I stayed silent, but that really only allowed these misperceptions to perpetuate and more silence. And so we were like caught in this catch-22 and like I just all at once realized kind of that I want to be part of the solution. I didn't want to be caught in this catch-22. So um, I had studied creative nonfiction when I was in undergrad. So it wasn't totally random to decide to write a memoir about my own experience. Uh, I remember thinking like narcolepsy isn't fun by any means, but it's certainly not boring either. Uh, and so was excited to take on writing a book. A few months after moving to Washington DC, a, a Kevin who was a co-founder of a narcolepsy nonprofit called Wake Up Narcolepsy, he contacted me over email and said, hey, do you know anyone that might like to run the Boston Marathon uh, for narcolepsy research? And I thought about it for like 0.2 seconds, I'd say, and hit reply and said, yeah, I'd like to do that. Um, I know I'd mentioned that I had been a huge runner before my diagnosis, but for those second and third year of law school, I'd really stopped 
working out kind of all together because of the runner's knee injury. And also just, I was trying to adjust the medications and just trying to get by. So I kind of, at this point was in the worst shape of my life, uh, but had this great opportunity to run the Boston marathon for narcolepsy research. Uh, and so, um, you know, I thought, I just have to try this. I don't know how it'll work. I'd never even run more than seven miles in my whole life. Uh, so I did walk running for my training, um, at which so I walked two minutes and I ran eight minutes back and forth like that. I also got a medical alert bracelet. So, you know, if anything happened, there was a number on there to uh, find out all the information about cataplexy and all this. And my parents weren't so excited about this idea of the marathon at first, I don't think, but, um, you know, uh, came around to it when I said I got the medical alert bracelet and, and I, I really felt like running of all things wasn't the most dangerous thing with cataplexy. Uh, I could just fall to the ground as opposed to something like swimming or being on an escalator. There's a lot uh, more like dangerous situations. Um, and so uh, I didn't actually have much cataplexy when I, when I trained for the marathon, which was good. And if I did feel like I was going to have cataplexy, then I didn't, I didn't train on that day. Um, and when I decided to take on this marathon is when I thought to start a blog, blogs were new back then, which I know they're like so old fashioned now, but this is 11 years ago. So, uh, I started my blog called the REM runner blog. And, uh, that was when I published on that blog the first day and said, hi, I'm Julie Flygar. I'm a person with narcolepsy running this marathon. That was the first time I'd said publicly, uh, you know, on the internet that I had narcolepsy, which was a very big decision. But at this point I knew I was going to write a book. And so, um, you know, I was willing to put my, my name forward and, and the, my face and say, I have narcolepsy. Um, and I, I thought that this blog would help my friends and family, uh, to read a little bit about my narcolepsy and then donate to my marathon, uh, which definitely did, but also other people with narcolepsy, like found my blog from around the world and started reaching out, which was really cool. I did take on that Boston Marathon in 2010, which is now 10 years ago in April. Um, and I did have a little bit of cataplexy when I spotted my dad at the halfway. I, I knew about where he'd be. And uh, so he was there with my stepmom and one of my best friends from college and her family. So when I made eye contact with them, my knees buckled a little bit, but I was okay. And um, I did have some emergency um, antidepressant medication with me, my little fanny pack that I could take if I started to feel my cataplexy was much worse, but um, it seemed manageable. My dad did say, are you sure you're okay? Did I see, you know, a little cataplexy? And I said, yeah, but I, I think I'm okay. So I tried to keep my head down for most of the race and I listened to my music. So, you know, I kind of stayed emotionally, you know, as centered as possible. Um, people will say that I was the most smiley marathon runner because I did take my time with my walk running plan. And so as other people were getting more tired, I was like gaining um, in speed at the end of the marathon. Uh, and I was just glowing. To cross the finish line, uh, it was actually four hours and 41 minutes. Not that I'm competitive at all. I know it says uh, four hours and 56. Um, and to cross the finish line and to feel my legs feel so strong when I knew in my own body what it feels like to feel that I can't control my own body was an amazing moment of strength that I'll never forget. Um, when I trained for that marathon, I started to do some media work and, um, you know, I like to say that I caught the advocacy bug, which is like the best chronic condition. Uh, so once I did start speaking up about my experience and sharing it with, uh, the media, I didn't want to ever stop. It was great. Um, a lot of the same stories that I felt a little bit uncomfortable telling my friends or my family, you know, I could tell reporters, uh, or medical school classes and they'd thank me for my for sharing my story. And I was like, this is amazing. Uh, and so had some, you know, really cool opportunities to do a lot of media work over my first few years uh, of, you know, speaking up. I also really thought that like, I just wanted to write a memoir about my experience. And I'd heard that if you wanted to get a publisher, you needed to like be like in the public eye. So even though it would have been my preference to kind of like write my book from under a rock, um, and not be so public and like be giving presentations and all that. Uh, it wasn't my nature at first, but I found that I did really like it once I got started. So five years after my diagnosis, I made the really, you know, big choice to found my own nonprofit called Project Sleep. 
So I'm going to go through some updates now of like my professional stuff. And I will get back to my personal stuff to like share a little bit more about like how I'm doing personally, but first kind of like the professional stuff. Um, a founding Project Sleep uh, now seven years ago, I guess, uh, to make sleep cool. Uh, this nonprofit has an emphasis on trying to raise awareness about sleep health and sleep disorders. So after being in the field for about five years and doing a lot of research on what was out there, volunteering for a bunch of nonprofits, working for nonprofits, I really felt like there were people talking about sleep health and there was different people talking about sleep disorders. And those conversations weren't together. And I thought that was an important bridge to, to bring together. Uh, and that there was space for a patient-driven organization that um, was paying attention to sleep health and sleep disorders generally, um, really promoting a message that sleepiness is not laziness. Uh, it, and also that sleepiness can be quite invisible, like my experience, or it can be really misunderstood to be laziness or a lack of willpower. I have just felt so passionate about making sure that other people aren't going years or a lifetime um, experiencing this sleepiness that's like real, um, but not knowing that there's a real reason for it. Um, and so, yeah, this is one of our postcards. It says sleep disorders are real, <laughs> learn the facts. Um, so th these are just a bunch of logos here of our different programs, but uh, the nonprofit is a lot more than just a bunch of logos. Uh, it's actually involves hundreds and hundreds of people. Uh, so uh, Project Sleep has a board of directors. It's an amazing group uh, that helps to steer our organization on a strategy level. And then we have just hundreds of volunteers, advocates, speakers, writers, uh, donors, just a huge, huge, huge group of people behind these, you know, pretty logos here. Um, and so I'm going to go through some of this programming a little bit more closely here. We started a scholarship now seven years ago. So these are our 2019 scholarship recipients for students with narcolepsy and idiopathic hypersomnia. Uh, we partner with the Hypersomnia Foundation to give out scholarships for students with idiopathic hypersomnia. And um, so last year we gave out 18. We have now given out 68 scholarships in six years. And please stay tuned because next month we will be announcing the 2020 scholarship recipients, uh, which we're really, really excited about. We're currently reviewing their applications and it's hard every year. You just, there's so many well-deserving applicants for this scholarship. Um, Project Sleep has this vision for progress, which is kind of like the goals that we wanna see specifically in the narcolepsy space uh, for this program. And we wanna see that the, to have the general population to at least heard of narcolepsy be increased to 80%. Right now it's about 70% of people have heard of narcolepsy. And we really wanna reduce the delays to diagnosis because right now on average, it takes eight to 15 years for a person with narcolepsy to be diagnosed. And that's for the lucky like 25% of people who ever get diagnosed. So reducing delays to diagnosis is super important for us as an, a nonprofit. And we wanna delay those, we don't want no, we want no delays, but uh, we hope to delay those down to an average of two years by 2030. And we also really wanna reduce stigma for people living with narcolepsy. So um, sorry to dork out for a few seconds, but stigma is a concept that is studied in a lot of other areas like epilepsy, mental illness, uh, HIV, um, so many different other things, but it's kind of new to the narcolepsy world. So if you're not familiar with the term stigma, it means it's uh, um, something that makes you different or somehow less than uh, what is perceived as normal in society. And um, there's stigma for narcolepsy at many levels. Um, there, the individual level is our own perceptions of stigma that were different, the community level, institutional level, law and policy, and media and entertainment. So all of these levels of stigma are influencing a person with narcolepsy's experience every day. Um, there's only been one uh, journal paper published yet so far studying stigma in narcolepsy, and it studies this yellow center, which is self-perceived stigma. And it showed that a lot of things is a great paper, but one of the findings is that the self stigma, uh, the feeling of otherness for young adults with narcolepsy is about the same level as, as young adults with HIV. 
And I just think that's really striking and important for people to realize like this is a real experience uh, for people living with narcolepsy to feel so different um, and somehow less than um, and isolated and, and that kind of stuff. Um, the other area I'm going to go over you right now is media and entertainment. So that's the big, big circle. Um, media and entertainment has not been kind to narcolepsy over many, many years. There have been many inaccurate portrayals of the condition that uh, perpetuate misperception, stigma, and delay diagnosis. Here are some of the movies that have featured characters with a version of narcolepsy that doesn't help people know that they could have the actual condition. Uh, some of these movies include Deuce Bigelow, Mel Gigolo is an early one in 1999. Uh, 20 years later now, in 2019, last year, there was a movie called Ode to Joy, which is focused on cataplexy in particular, and it's kind of an interesting uh, version of what it's like to live with narcolepsy with cataplexy. Uh, so maybe we've made some progress, but maybe not, I'm not really sure. Um, and there is a lot of misperceptions in the media. Uh, Vanity Fair article from a few years ago, uh, this title was narcoleptic Trump official Wilbur Ross now in charge of monetizing space. Well, I don't, Wilbur Ross, I don't know. He's like in his eighties or nineties, he's an old man. But um, I didn't like this calling him narcoleptic as if that meant that he was not fit for a job. So I did write the author and point this out to her. And uh, she did write back and said, you know, she was sorry and that she shouldn't have used that word. But um, he's just an old man. He's just a sleepy old man. He doesn't have narcolepsy. And, I, and to, to imagine someone's not qualified for their job because they have narcolepsy is uh, unconscionable in my opinion. Uh, late night hosts like Seth Meyers is a, a re repeat offender. I do love his show, but um, here he's in one of his many times, uh, you know, this is Rudy Giuliani who looked asleep, I guess. And so Seth Meyers is making a joke saying, hope he gets his narcolepsy cured soon. Um, and uh, just from my own personal life to switch gears completely, I joined Facebook dating uh, for a brief little bit uh, earlier this year. And uh, this one profile of this man that I matched with, he had a bunch of things listed, you know, like my friends would describe me as funny and charismatic. I'm like a good cook, I'm open-minded. he said, and I've been known to cure narcolepsy just by walking into the room. I don't know. I haven't seen any other like serious neurological conditions like as jokes in dating profiles. Not yet. I've seen a lot of dating profiles. I've been single for a while, but um, <laughs> so I did. I, I did like like him back because you know, hey, why not? And I did try to say, hey, how are you going to cure my narcolepsy? And he thought I was joking at first. <laughs> but then I think he realized I was uh, serious and tried to ask me on a date, but I didn't actually want to go on a date. I just wanted to help raise awareness. So, so this is some of the reactive, you know, work, uh, but I just want to point out the difference between a reactive approach and a proactive. So this is when we, we react to what other people are saying about narcolepsy. A different approach is proactive work, and that's what I'm most passionate about. So one of the ways that we think to proactively raise accurate awareness about narcolepsy is by sharing our stories. Um, sharing your stories is actually scientifically shown to be super powerful for fostering empathy and for raising awareness, inspiring action, reducing stigma, creating role models, and empowering storytellers. Storytellers. So this is a really cute image, but it's also like that's all like all those little points there are scientifically, um, you know, shown that storytelling is very very powerful over facts and figures. So we often lean on facts and figures to raise awareness, but really your own personal story is super powerful. And I guess that was intuitive to me and why I decided to write a memoir, but now I learned that there's actually science to back it up, <laughs> that approach. And uh, so as part of Project Sleep's programming, we have the Rising Voices of Narcolepsy program, which is one of my favorites. We are fostering a new generation of narcolepsy patient advocates, spreading awareness by speaking and writing while also empowering them. Um, and I love this now because um, truthfully, I'm sick of hearing my own story, but um, I love hearing other people's stories and helping them uh, to make effective presentations and, and articles. Um, and so it just feels like the perfect progression in my journey of having shared my own story and now getting to help others do the same and giving them a platform. 
So just a small advertisement in the middle of this presentation. If you haven't yet uh, checked out, we've been doing a story sharing series and um, Anna Marr here, she's one of the presenters and she's also been really spearheading this effort behind the scenes to prepare all of these great speakers and writers to be able to share their stories. So we've been doing these on Sunday nights and here are the ones we've already done and, and there'll be another one next Sunday. Uh, so please, please, please check out these other stories. I think there's an inclination. Often people like get familiar with me and they get familiar with my book and maybe you've come in to listen to this broadcast. Um, I can't emphasize enough though, how each one of these people are just as amazing and you will love them. I'm always trying to connect people and say, you're gonna love Brittany's story. You're gonna love Ebony's story um, because these people are, you know, just everyone has such an important story and such a different story. And that's really important to me to be elevating these different voices. So um, last year we founded the World Narcolepsy Day with 24 different organizations around the world this is a huge undertaking that these organizations work together to create this day. And here are just a few photos. Uh, the one up top is from Ireland. They did kite flying events on different beaches in Ireland. Um, here I am at the uh, World Sleep Congress up in Vancouver, Canada with a researcher. Um, I think she was from Japan, uh, maybe Malaysia actually, if I remember correctly. And uh, here we are celebrating World Narcolepsy Day there. And in the bottom is a photo of the Italian uh, narcolepsy organization. They celebrated World Narcolepsy Day with a, uh, with a volleyball tournament in, I believe it was in Rome. So it was a really wonderful day. And I have to say for myself, I was up in Vancouver. We had this photo booth, uh, we had a broadcast. It was just a busy, busy, busy day. And I got home that night uh, to the Airbnb I was staying at. And that's the first time I checked social media. <laughs> and saw all the people that were posting from around the world and I just lost it. I was just like sobbing, but like in the best way, but it's so crazy to have taken something from an idea in my head to work with these different organizations and gain their support and their trust. And then to have people around the world posting about this day <laughs> that we created together. Um, and so I, it's just was one of the most special moments. So thank you for everyone that participated in this, this event and helped make this possible because yeah, it started like as an idea in my own head, but like that didn't get it to where it is today and where it's going to go. So we have an advocacy program, which I'm super proud of as well. Uh, here are some of the things that we are doing. We're promoting sleep research, making sure that NIH is funding enough sleep research uh, and sleep disorders research accelerating treatment options, making sure that treatments are helping to be advanced through the FDA, ensuring affordable access to healthcare, which is super important and something we're working on a lot more this year uh, and is also important in the wake of COVID-19 and as people might be losing their jobs across this country, that we are doing what we can to make sure that people are going to be able to continue to access treatment. So um, this is just some of the work that we work on with our experts in Washington, DC and um, making sure that education and awareness continue as well. So we're trying to work on getting the CDC to have a program that sleep could uh, apply for, you know, sleep organizations could apply for to be raising awareness about sleep health and sleep disorders, which is so important uh, because we're doing a lot as small organizations right now, like organizations like Project Sleep, but there's so much more to be done. So um, we've had a lot of great success with our advocacy here are some of the House of Representatives, uh, members of the House of Representatives who recently signed on to a letter that we did in the House. And we got 41 different representatives across the country. And that was thanks to all of the advocates hard work to get them signed on. Uh, so just a few tips for advocacy and awareness. I realized thinking about this that I could do a whole different presentation on this. And obviously I run the Rising Voices of Narcolepsy program, which is a whole you know, month long process on, on how to learn how to share your story. So there's a lot of opportunities to get more involved and to learn more. But I tried to think of like a few tips that would be applicable to anyone also, like even if it's not narcolepsy awareness or narcolepsy advocacy, that's your thing and you're watching this. Um, I just wanna give some general tips that I wish I'd known earlier in my experience as an advocate for anything. Um, the first is, I think it's really easy to have a mindset of knowing that um, being able to pick out the problems. 
right? So if you're impatient like me and you see there's a lot of need, there's a great amount of need in the area and there's a lot of change that needs to happen and you really wanna have that, see that change happen right now. It can seem easy to say to other people, you should do this, you know, you should have this program, you should have that program, you should be doing this. Um, one of the greatest mind shifts I've made is to, instead of thinking someone else should do something, is reframing that into a question and saying, how might we, including me in the solution, make this change? And it's a more approachable way. Not only is it um, you know, helpful to think of yourself as part of a solution for a problem, but it's also just more approachable to other people. So instead of going on Twitter and saying, there's not enough awareness about narcolepsy you know, in Canada or you know, in Australia or you know, wherever, because there's not enough anywhere, to be honest, but reframe that into something like, how might we raise more awareness in Canada? And that just allows people to enter conversation with you and to think of what you can do too as part of the solution. So um, I hope that's helpful. Also, this is like my tagline for World Narcolepsy Day efforts at Project Sleep last year, which is, you know, World Narcolepsy Day, world, it's huge, global awareness, but global really starts with local. And so, you know, remembering that even if you want to change the world, you just do that by small steps and even in your own communities and stepping forward and thinking what you can do in your own community is going to be hugely impactful. And this is a huge one, the third one, emotional sort support versus logistical support. I bring this up because I think a lot of advocacy is often advocating for yourself at a doctor's office, at a school, or at a workplace. And this probably applies to other things as well in your life, but often we need logistical support. We need support uh, in the way of work accommodations or school accommodations. Um, and that's really different from needing emotional support, which we also really need. <laughs> But that's more like um, processing your feelings about something. And um, for me, what I've learned is that I, I separate those two. And I know that I need to you know, have people who get it, right? And um, so there are people who get it, who get my struggles and my frustrations. I reach out to those people for my emotional support. And I think that's important for helping me let go a little bit of looking for maybe emotional support from other people who maybe don't get it, but who I need logistical support for from. So I might not need the dean of my law school to know what it's like every day to be in my, uh, to be walk in my shoes, or I don't need the, you know, HR director of a job to get everything. I just need them to help me with my goals for getting logistical support, and then I go and I complain to my sister or my friends uh, or my therapist, you know, those are kind of how I, I ended up, I kind of separate who I get emotional support from. And it helps me to worry less if some people in my life don't get it. And so I think that kind of helps. The other thing is community. Um, so you can get emotional support from this great, great, great community in the sleep space. Project Sleep is just one organization uh, here in the US. There are many. Uh, on this slide, I've included some of the best and the ones that we work with and that we see as really active in the patient advocacy community. There are more, and there are many organizations internationally as well. But the Circadian Sleep Disorders Network, the Hypersomnia Foundation, the Klein-Levin Syndrome Foundation, Narcolepsy Network, Restless Leg Syndrome Foundation, Sleep Apnea, American Sleep Apnea Association, Start School Later, and Wake Up Narcolepsy. Those are the organizations that if you're not familiar with them and you know you have particular issues in some of these areas, please, please, please get connected to these organizations. Community, there's just nothing like, there's just nothing like it. And they have great resources and they're helping people in different ways. So, so now a little bit more on my personal side. I've already told you about the update of my love life, obviously, because I told you I was on Facebook dating. Uh, so we know how well that is going. <laughs> Not well, um, but I will say living with narcolepsy, you know, living well, it really depends on each person's goals. And uh, for me, um, I found there's a really a four pillars of treating narcolepsy and not always are all those four pillars recognized. And I think all four are super important. So that includes treatments or medications. I take medication still twice a night and once a day. 
I take naps. I remember at first thinking that if I took medication, I would be getting rid of the naps completely. And then thinking my treatments aren't working because I was still napping, but actually they still really include my cognitive functioning and reduce my symptoms, but I still do take a nap at least once a day. And not everyone finds naps restful, but I do. Coping mechanisms like diet, exercise, and sleep hygiene. I say for me, like exercise hasn't cured my narcolepsy at all, but um, it certainly made me feel stronger and feeling stronger and healthy is like a good thing no matter what. Uh, whether you're a person with narcolepsy or not. So I think that's really helped me. And social support is really underrecognized, but online and in-person support groups, therapy and conferences and social media, really important. I'd really like to have another symptom added to the symptom list of narcolepsy. And it's probably true for, true for a lot of different chronic conditions or invisible conditions. I think feeling alone and misunderstood should be added as a symptom so that you know, doctors have it on the top of their mind and how they think about treating someone with narcolepsy and, and making sure that we're really addressing that sense, you know, feeling of aloneness or, or feeling misunderstood. So a few things. I did go back and see Wicked again. Yay! I saw it in LA a few years ago and stayed awake the whole time and it was amazing. Uh, so I was happy to see the whole this, my whole, uh, the whole of my favorite musical, it's still my favorite musical to this day. I just love it. Um, and I, I like to say though, setting boundaries and then knocking them down over time. So, um, it can be helpful. Like I set a rule when I lived in Washington, DC for four years, I set a rule that I didn't drive any more than 40 minutes. So if my friends and I were going to go somewhere that was over 40 minutes, they kind of just knew that was the rule and we would have to make other adjustments. Now I could of course drive longer than 40 minutes if I, you know, if it was a certain time of day that was good, but just having those boundaries or those set rules like that helped the other people in my life kind of get that there was some logistical considerations for longer trips. And so that was really helpful. And then over time, you know, you can slowly adjust those uh, boundaries. And I ended up helping uh, drive cross country when I moved out to Los Angeles now six and a half years ago. So I did great on certain segments of the drive. Uh, I also slept a lot of the drive, but um, you know, it's just about setting your own boundaries and then over time you can adjust them. I love this quote too, I can do anything, but I can't do everything. And I think that's true for everyone, but especially for people with narcolepsy, just prioritizing my time very carefully. Um, I've subsequently run two more marathons. I ran the San Diego Rock and Roll Marathon, and then this is the Griffith Park Trail Marathon, which I ran two years ago. And that's I, I live right at the at the bottom of Griffith Park here in Los Angeles, so it was really cool to do my first trail marathon, and uh, in my own backyard. I uh, did have some cataplexy that same day. Later that day, after I had finished the marathon, in six hours. It was, it was a tough one. It was like very hilly or mountainy actually. Um, so it took me six hours to finish. And then I, after the marathon, I did rest. I slept for a few hours and then I was celebrating with some friends uh, and neighbors in my courtyard here. And um, as someone said something funny, my you know hand kind of gave out and I, and I did experience cataplexy the same day I ran a marathon. And I just like to point that out because I think it's important to remember that um, people with narcolepsy or with other chronic conditions aren't just like healthy or aren't just like sick people. It's somewhere in between. And I think we as a society like to box people into, you know, something black and white. We like to say, you're a person with narcolepsy or you're a healthy person. And my experience is that life is much more gray than that. And that I can be both, you know, healthy looking and sick on the same day. And I love that. I don't think that should be discouraged. I think we should recognize that we each have a lot to us. And also we can always be evolving. None of us are the same forever. Even our own experience with narcolepsy evolves over time. The spoon theory is something that has helped me personally uh, with some relationships because I think uh, beyond the fact that narcolepsy uh, has the symptom list, uh, this spoon theory was uh, created by a woman who has lupus, I believe. Her friend said, I, I don't quite understand you know, what you go through. So they were at a cafe and she collected the different spoons that were on the table and said, okay, you have like eight spoons for your day. Uh, what do you do when you wake up? You, you know, take a shower, ooh, take a shower, that takes a spoon. You're gonna drive to work? Oh, that takes a spoon. Feeding the dogs? Oh, that takes a spoon. What are you doing at work? Spreadsheets? Oh no, two spoons for spreadsheets. 
So basically the concept is you get to the end of the day and you get home and you haven't made dinner yet, but you have one spoon left. And uh, if you make dinner, you use that spoon, but you also have laundry on your bed. And if you make dinner, you're not gonna have the spoon for doing the dishes. So it's a concept of limited energy expenditure, meaning that um, maybe just have less energy in a day uh, than an average person. And I think that's helpful because it's not a direct symptom of narcolepsy, uh, but oftentimes at night, um, with an ex-boyfriend of mine, he wanted to just do a lot. He was an extrovert. <laughs> so every night of the week, he could be going to a different comedy show or, you know, concert or something like that. And for me, that was really challenging. And it wasn't necessarily that I was going to have a cataplexy attack or I was going to have a, you know, an episode of sleepiness while at the comedy show. It's just that I had limited spoons and I had to choose how carefully I chose to ex extend that energy. So that concept has been helpful for me and for some other people in the chronic illness space, if you're not familiar with it. It's an exciting time for narcolepsy research and drug development. Uh, there are new compounds in development. And if you guys haven't yet seen my interview with Dr. Mignot a few weeks ago, please check that out. We talk about some different treatments that are new and upcoming. Um, we also talk about how there's you know, better understanding now of some of the biological causes for type one narcolepsy which is exciting. Uh, they're getting closer to, you know, really pinpointing the autoimmune process that underlies the uh, development. We're also improving the classifications of type two narcolepsy without cataplexy and idiopathic hypersomnia. Uh, it's kind of a challenging time as far as understanding what those conditions are, but finally, you know, I really feel excited because researchers are really diving in to understand what are these and how can we reclassify them in a way that make more sense so that people aren't switching diagnoses and, and feeling, you know, um, having access to medication if you have type two narcolepsy and then somehow losing access if you have idiopathic hypersomnia. So um, this is an exciting time for that area. And it's a great time to think about participating in clinical trials. Maybe not this precise, precise moment because COVID-19 is happening, but I believe even for the clinical trials that might be paused right now that you can still go online and be screened to see if you might be able to participate. So that is ongoing and it's important that people participate in clinical trials to advance progress because we can't get treatments if people with narcolepsy don't participate in the clinical trials. Oh, I also just want to note, um, recently published a short little comment on uh, narcolepsy and COVID-19, sleeping on an opportunity with uh, two wonderful researchers at the University of Arizona, Dr. Fernandez and Dr. Granier. So um, check out that little paper if you haven't seen that. So in closing, I promise I'm almost done. I'm sorry, I've gone over way longer, I'm sorry, I'm just sorry, this went so long, but I'm almost done. Um, I published my book three years after I started that. Um, and so in 2012, I was so glad to get my story out there. Uh, and thank you guys for reading it and for sharing it and writing reviews uh, and all that good stuff. I really wrote it for people that don't have narcolepsy to open their hearts and minds to uh, one experience. It's not everyone's experience, but my experience but it was really powerful that a lot of other people with narcolepsy reached out to me and said when they read my book for the first time, they didn't feel alone. And it started to feel striking because so many people were saying that to me and I thought like, I know they're not alone because they're all contacting me, but still in their own lives, in their own cities and, and you know towns across this country and around the world, people were still feeling so isolated. So that inspired me to found the Narcolepsy Not Alone campaign, which is now, I think six years ago. Um, and so in closing, I like to share these photos because I think it's also important for people to realize that this is just one story and there are so many different people with narcolepsy. We are certainly not unicorns. We are out there. One in every 2,000 people have narcolepsy. Unless I shared it with you, you probably wouldn't know that I have it. So you might not even know who in your life has narcolepsy. So I shared this photo and I asked other people to do the same. And so I'm just going to close with sharing a few photos from the campaign. This is Adam in Australia. This is Mo in Dubai and Rianne in the UK. This is Nancy in Maryland. I absolutely, I absolutely love her sign. This is Debbie and Nancy in Iowa. This is Michelle and her friends and family in Massachusetts. This is Elaine and her family in Ireland. This is Kim in South Korea. 
This is Tim in Wales, Brianna in Minnesota, Todd in Canada, and Eduardo in Brazil. This is Barrymon and Eric in Virginia, and Colin and Connor in Mississippi. This is Katie in Australia. This is Lisa in New Zealand. This is Keenan, a little five-year-old having his sleep study in the UK, Maria in Spain, and Liam in Scotland. This is Nils and Mil in Sweden and Kenya in South Carolina. This is Jessica in Oklahoma. This is Julie in North Carolina and Katie who lives in South Africa. She's American, but she lives there as a reporter. This is, um, sorry, so funny to see these pictures now because both these kids are so grown up. This is Sam in the UK and Matilda and myself in California. This is Kevin in Virginia. This is Ben and his dad, James, in the French Alps. Diane in Texas. This is Alexander in Ireland. Mike in Texas, and I only know this person's Twitter handle is Anarko, which I assume is not the real name, in Japan. Chloe in Scotland. This is, I'm not gonna say her name right. I wanna say Yijuan in Singapore, Sammy in France, Katie in the UK and Emily in Sweden. This is Wendy, a nurse practitioner in Texas. These are some of our canine supporters. My dad's dog, Socks. Um, Theodore in Australia. And this is my friend, um, Danielle and her support dog, Rolo, were at a Narcolepsy Network conference. I believe that one was in Colorado. We had another canine supporter recently join the campaign. This is Watson, who has narcolepsy with cataplexy himself and is Dr. Mignot's dog. Big shout out to all the mothers today, uh, whether you are a mother of a daughter with narcolepsy, like Corey, uh, who is the mother of Lindsay up in Alberta, Canada, or you are a person with narcolepsy who is a mother yourself, you're amazing. This is my support group in Australia. Uh, this is not in Australia. I live in Los Angeles. This is Sam, Jane, Ben, and Gadget, and myself in Ireland. These are conferences and support groups around the world in the UK, Seattle, Spain, San Diego, Canada, Ohio, and Japan, Sweden, Italy, and Australia. So this campaign, the Narcops Not Alone campaign has over 1,400 photos from all US, all 50 US states and 49 countries around the world now. Um, so I just want to remind you that behind every one of these photos is an amazing person an amazing story. Um, <clears throat> I truly believe that, sorry, the stories we tell shape the world we live in. And so I just wanna remind you that your story matters and that you are amazing, you are overcoming adversity and I promise to keep fighting every day if you promise to keep fighting every day too. So please save the date for World Narcolepsy Day 2020, September 22nd. And um, thank you for listening to my story. And I'm sorry it went so long. Ah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So I'm done now, I'm done talking. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing that. And please, if you have any questions, send them over via Facebook Live if you have possibly made it through all of this very long presentation. Um, and Anna will help get any questions that you guys might have over to me. So, yeah, I don't see any yet, um, but I think I remember, let's see. Anna and I talked about a question uh, that she was going to ask me. So um, 
what, what was the question we we're gonna, oh shoot. Um, I think we were going to talk about um, what I, hmm. I'm totally blanking. I just finished a presentation. I got that part done, but I don't remember the question. Um, I remember one was about my life now. I, I didn't really share. I live in LA, um, but I do have a lot of outside interests besides Project Sleep, uh, although it's pretty awesome. Oh yeah, okay, now I remember both questions. So I'll start with the, the other one actually is um, uh, taking over Project Sleep full time. So that happened about just over two years ago. I had founded Project Sleep back in 2013, but I was working full time at City of Hope, which is a cancer research center, and then at the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, which is a great nonprofit in the pancreatic cancer space. And um, Project Sleep was growing, which is great, uh, but I was doing that on the side and um, while working full time and driving across LA. And so at some point kind of realized that as Project Sleep was growing that possibly, um, you know, there might be a position there to lead that organization and that I might like to uh, see if the board of directors would possibly consider me for that role. And um, luckily they, they were happy to have me as the president and CEO running the organization. Um, it was just kind of like my narcolepsy journey where I had to like find some like self acceptance too, which I know sounds strange, but once I realized like this is what I wanted, like it was hard to realize like this is my dream job and just go after it. Um, and it shouldn't have, I don't think it should have been as challenging, but for whatever reason it was for me mentally to like realize like, okay, this is my dream job. Let's see how we can make it work um, and just put in the work. And, and so I just like that as a reminder that a lot of like, you know, you see a lot going on outside and we have these public lives and we have Instagram, but sometimes a lot of the journey is like this internal journey that we don't always share with anyone. And it's our own like decisions, and our old mental processes that can make huge shifts in our life. Uh, which is, you know, the decisions for me to write a book and to found Project Sleep and to take on Project Sleep full time. That is, you know, those moments where it was really just like these internal moments and then a lot of movement and a lot of other parts afterwards. Um, and then the other thing that Anna and I had talked about was just sharing a little bit about, you know, me today. So I no longer after, as of two years ago, I didn't have to commute anymore, which is great. Um, I could work from home, which works well for me. So I usually travel uh, though about once a month to different speaking engagements. Um, and that, so it kind of keeps me both, you know, I have time when I'm here in LA and I rest and I can work from home and have my naps right in my bed and my desk is right here and my bed's there because I live in a studio. So, <laughs> um, but then to be able to travel and get out and see people. Um, so it's usually a pretty good schedule. Um, and now of course, um, I'm just working from home and I'm not traveling and not speaking. So thanks for listening to me today. Um, I kind of missed speaking. <laughs> and then um, I have some uh, uh, like silly interests. So if you guys don't follow me on Instagram, I love gummy candy and I review gummy candy. Uh, very serious, you know, special reviews of gummy candy. Um, and I also love living in LA and I love, there's a lot of secret stairs, uh, which are these public stairs that are just like in neighborhoods. So you'll just be walking down a street and like, there'll be a staircase and you'll think like, is that someone's backyard? But actually a lot of them are public and there's a whole book about it. So I am on a quest to finish all 42 of those different stair walks um, around the, the city of LA. Um, I've just finished 19 of the walks. Um, so it's just something fun now that I do. I am not running very much. I mostly do the stairs uh, and walk or walk run. So I'm just taking it easy. I need to come up with a new challenge eventually to raise some more money probably um, for the scholarship. <laughs> but right now I'm not taking on any big athletic challenges. Just enjoying LA. Um, and I do drink alcohol sometimes. I, um, I really like jello shots. And I live in a building with a pool and we have pool parties sometimes and I'm known as Jello Shot Julie around the building. Um, so I can have a few of those during the day and sometimes I choose not to take my nighttime medication and, and to be able to drink alcohol. I don't do it super often, but it's nice to have it as an option and to realize that, you know, my decision to not drink alcohol wasn't like forever, like every night of my life that I could choose sometimes to take a night off from my medication. So 
it's been nice to add a little bit of normalcy um, to my life and to have some fun. And yeah, in my building, I'm known as Jello Shot Julie. <laughs> um, okay, we have a question. Thank you guys for listening and for being here. Um, so Kathleen would like to know uh, what is a nighttime treatment? So I take sodium oxybate or known as Xyrem. Um, and yeah, that's the nighttime medication I take. A uh, question from Lizzie. When you were working full time, what accommodations, if any, did you have? And what was most supportive during that time as you started Project Sleep? Um, so <clears throat> I've written a few blog posts about my accommodations experience uh, at City of Hope. It was a long journey. It started with me first, self-acceptance self first, realizing, okay, I need to get a space to be able to nap. I need to like take charge of this and not just try to like get through the day by eating sugar. Um, and so then my supervisor at City of Hope was super helpful, but we ran into like a lot of logistical problems um, and HR didn't quite get it. So I do feel really lucky for my supervisor's support through that experience, which was not great, but ultimately I did, they did create two wellness rooms in the building I worked in uh, for where I napped and where other people could nap or rest or meditate or, you know, whatever. So um, I found that was the most important for me, logistically speaking. And my supervisor at that job at City of Hope was just super understanding. So I remember one time she said to me, I was a little bit late for work and just said, sorry, I had a hard morning. And she said, just don't come here unless you feel well enough to be here. And it was just this huge weight off my shoulders. And so because of my work wasn't time sensitive, I was a writer um, at, City of Hope, I mostly didn't have time sensitive projects and I could work on my own pace. And so um, that was really helpful. And um, yeah, I think that's it. I don't think I got any special accommodations when I worked at Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. I just went to my car when I needed to take a nap. Um, and I did that, you know, kind of at my own pace. Uh, I had a lot of freedom there uh, to know, again, like when I needed to get things done and when I could try to go take naps. It wasn't always perfect by any means, but um, taking on Project Sleep full-time, what was most supportive was uh, just kind of internally figuring it out. I want to do that. And um, I just said to myself, like, I just need to try because I couldn't quite believe I could make it work. And I said, just try, just see if you can do this. And um, so trying turned into actually doing <laughs> for me and I, just had to keep like realizing like, what am I so afraid of? Um, and I thought that, um, you know, I could really, really do this. I don't know what I'm so afraid of. And, um, you know, I had a few close friends that were really supportive of this decision and like the board of directors for Project Sleep really believed in me to do it. And so, um, you know, finding out that it was for me internally and then having their support, I guess I'd say it was very helpful. And then third question from Sally, uh, how can we get a uh, severe brain fog recognized as one of the symptoms of narcolepsy? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So I've done some work in recognizing brain fog as a real part of narcolepsy's experience. I didn't go into any of that here today. Uh, so Sally, you must have watched some of my other videos, I think. Um, but yeah, uh, I am really believe that patient advocates should be part of the research process from the beginning, no matter what you're doing. If you're doing a clinical trial, uh, if you're developing an app for narcolepsy, if you're um, you know, writing a paper, I really think patient advocates should be part of that experience. And uh, so one of the examples I use is that a lot of people with narcolepsy uh, experience brain fog, and it's just not really part of the clinical discussion or the symptom list. So um, great question, Sally. I don't know, we're working on it. There's a the new study that's going to be uh, looked at in children with narcolepsy, uh, headed by Dr. Karen Maskey at Boston Children's. And they'll be looking at some patient reported outcomes for narcolepsy. And one of them will be starting to explore that area of brain fog more. It's a slow process. I'll say research is slow, but um, I think that we're getting there. Um, and so thank you for highlighting that because it's, it's so true to so many people's experiences, Sally. Um, and so we just need to keep raising our voices and I'll keep looking for ways to uh, continue that conversation. The good thing is, is a great time because they really are relooking at 
narcolepsy type two and idiopathic hypersomnia, trying to understand those conditions better and how to reclassify them. So I think there's momentum to have people pause and look back and say, are we defining narcolepsy the right way? Um, and I personally definitely plan on being part of that conversation um, and feel very passionately about how we define narcolepsy and um, how we talk about it is very influential and um, could hinder our ability to get people diagnosed in some ways as well. Um, okay, another question. When you travel alone, do you have a hard time staying awake while waiting to board your plane? Oh, great question, Chelsea. Uh, yeah, sometimes I do have trouble staying awake when I'm waiting for a plane. Uh, that I, does happen, usually after a long day in Washington, DC, as I've been advocating all day in Washington, DC, and I'm taking a five or 6 p.m. flight back to LA. Um, I uh, just kind of wrap my bags around myself. So like, so that if someone were to try to steal my purse, like they would wake me up in the process because I've wrapped my hands somehow, I don't know, <laughs> um, into a pretzel around my bags. And that's just how I do that. I don't like it, but I will say airports and airplanes are some of the best places to be sleepy because it's like being like sleepy at an airport or on an airplane is so socially acceptable. Like taking a nap is no problem. No one's gonna look at you twice. So um, it's, it is kind of annoying, but I found that of all places, it's not the worst, um, but certainly, you know, part of the experience for sure. Um, I was in DC one day where I didn't have anywhere to go to nap. And I even tried to look up like best places to nap in Washington, DC. Uh, there wasn't really anything, but I, I ended up sitting on the national mall and uh, under a tree. Um, and I, I felt like okay about it. And I kind of leaned my head up against the tree until I started to feel ants <laughs> on my legs. So it ended up being like one of those moments where I, I really felt bad for myself, <laughs> but, um, it all, you know, I guess worked out not great, but, uh, I couldn't in that moment find anywhere else. Um, a question from Eilish, um, what is one of your next goals for project sleep, uh, or a boundary that you want to break down? So like I just said, thank you, Eilish, for that question. I am really passionate about having patient advocates be part of the research process. And I believe that our insight will really help to strategize and, and set goals for research uh, that is more patient centric. So um, I am working on uh, hopefully developing a research project that would be studying whether social support is actually helps to improve outcomes for people with narcolepsy. I am so excited. I could talk about it all day, but I won't. Uh, but it's just important to me that I believe in social support. I believe that when you find that sense of connection with someone else, um, or if you find a role model, right? Um, whether that's me or someone else, right? Because we just did this whole thing on nurses with narcolepsy. It was spearheaded by Anna Marr, and she wrote this beautiful post. And we had multiple people reach out to us that were nursing students and say that seeing that there were other people that were doing nursing, you know, with narcolepsy, it gave them that extra energy or that extra hope that they needed to finish their schooling and to know that they could really do that. So I truly believe in the power of social support. Um, and I think in other areas, it's more accepted that it's a beneficial. Um, so there's research in epilepsy, HIV, mental illness, um, there's one study looking at sleep apnea and a peer support program, but it's somewhat new to narcolepsy on a research level. We all know it helps, but um, let's get clinicians to start thinking about that more. So that's one of the things I'm working on during COVID-19. <laughs> um, don't think we have any other questions right now. So I'm so sorry that this has been so long. Thank you so much for those of you that tuned in and stayed listening. Um, I appreciate your support so much. Um, and thank you again for listening to my story and for being part of this team. Um, Project Sleep is truly a dream team. Um, and I get so emotional with the early parts of my journey because I only wish I could see where I was today <clears throat> back then to know that graduating from law school was an accomplishment and that um, taking on running an organization would be you know, an amazing thing like this. 
I never knew that there would be such a bright future for me. And so I just want each of you to know that there's so much to each of you and um, hope that, you know, this is a little bit inspiring in some way or that you know you're not alone. And yeah. All right, guys, we will see you again next weekend, next Sunday, uh, for another great speaker uh, at 8 p.m. Eastern time. And we'll be announcing that on Tuesday, I believe. So stay tuned for that. And everyone stay safe and healthy. And thanks again for all your support. All right, bye for now.